a new edition of Book Chat on Majira, and today our guest is Richard Owen Roberts, the author of this book, which has just won the Guardian's Not the Booker Prize in the United Kingdom. If you're not familiar with uh, the prize systems in the United Kingdom, uh, let me say briefly that the Booker Prize is the sort of big elite establishment prize, and the Guardian set up this prize because the Booker Prize was so institutional. They wanted something a little bit more daring and edgy, and uh, it's proved a great success, so much so that it may be necessary to create the Not the, not the Booker Prize uh, uh, one day. But at, at any rate, it's a great achievement. It's one of the major prizes in the United Kingdom, so we're very pleased and uh, honoured to have Richard here with us. Now, this is a, it's a wonderful little book, um, it's not Richard's first book. He wrote a book of short stories before that. Let me just say uh, a couple of words about the storyline before I ask Richard to comment on it. Um, well, the storyline couldn't be simpler. The main character's name is Hill. Uh, he, at the beginning of the book, he's returning to the island on which he was brought up, Inismon, off the Welsh coast. This island has another name, which I'm been told I'm not to pronounce because uh, <laughs> because uh, it's uh, a name favoured by Anglo-Saxons. And he returns to this island, it's one of the main islands off the coast of Britain, because his father, whom he knows as Roger, is uh, dying. And Hill has uh, lost his mother when he was 11, she committed suicide, for which he blames his father. He's lost his wife, and his father is about to depart this world. So we have all of the ingredients there for an extremely lugubrious and uh, um, moody and uh, moody novel full of grief, which in a sense it is, but it's uplifted by a curious and eccentric comic vein. When Hill arrives on his island, he meets the carer who takes care of his ailing father, uh, a young woman called Trudy. I mean, I imagine they're both in their 30s, approximately, but Trudy is a, a bit of an oddball. Uh, she's apparently doing a PhD. She has presented uh, children's programs, I think, on Welsh TV. Uh, she smokes joints, uh, she hangs around, and they sort of hit it off and have um, a curious, uh, how could I explain it, you know? St slight, slightly standoffish relationship. They leave each other space, but they're going to see where it's going, though it's not going very far because Trudy is about to leave to live in Australia. So um, that more or less is the storyline, except that uh, Roger dies at the end of the book. But what comes in between is um, a very curious novel full of incidental detail and extremely vivid observation of how people behave and how they speak. And it's also a novel that's uh, totally in touch with the multimedia universe in which we live, particularly social media, Google and WhatsApp and um, emails and SMS and Netflix. It's all there and it's very, very, it's a very, very rich um, cauldron of um, cultural references. But let me stop there and ask you, Richard, where did it come from? Where, where did the idea for this book come from? Um, well, it's probably not mega helpful for me to say I can't specify exactly where it came from, but I guess what um, ultimately, I guess my preoccupations um, around that time and in general, uh, having been born and raised on Anismon, it's okay if you want to say the A word, that's fine, you can say it, but um, I, I will call it Anismon. <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess the island is always with me and I was really interested in what the island is like now and how kind of I, I view it as someone born and raised there, but who hasn't lived there for, um, I guess, going on for 20 years. And then in terms of um, the issues of, I guess, grief and acceptance and kind of stalled life, these were probably things I was thinking a lot about and it just seemed interesting and amusing to me to just put them down and just start typing and, just, and see what grew from that. Um, but I guess probably 
a culmination of of all of those things just prompted me and I get the novel came in some you're right it is a really straightforward um plot and it just it just kind of arrived pretty much um ready for me to start typing yes and it's written in a very episodic way they there are short medium long chapters they have chapter heading, but the chapter heading could be 8.15 sitting on the toilet trying to write an email, for example. Um, and then the style of each section or chapter or whatever you want to call it, segment, uh, is very varied. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be in the form of a list. Sometimes it can be a, in the form of a um, an unfinished email to Jack Black, because I should have mentioned that uh, Hill, the main character, is a filmmaker and he's trying desperately to get Jack Black, who's a real character, isn't he? He's an American actor. He is, yeah. Jack Black has taken an option on a film story that he's presented and has not followed through, as often happens with film options. So he's desperately trying to um, um, prick Jack Black into action and revive this thing, which is probably dead in the water. But, so in that case, we have a very entertaining, unfinished emails to Jack Black, which are basically sycophantic and, or furious, <laughs> the ones that don't get sent. Uh, there are um, WhatsApp messages, SMS messages. There's all, all, kind, all kinds of formats, if you like, for the writing, which, which adds to its richness, which adds to its contem contemporaneity, contemporaneousness. It's very much um, our world, or world just pre pre-coronavirus, I should say. Um, the cultural allusions to modern music, I mean, frankly, I had to look a lot of them up because I've been in rural France for so long that they just went right over my head. But so, so that was a little education in itself. Uh, um, I, yeah, I did forget to mention at the beginning that you're, you're Welsh and you live in Cardiff. I mean, how much do you think of yourself as a Welsh writer? And, what makes it? What makes you Welsh? If I'd, if we'd said that this uh, this book was set on the Isle of Wight and not in in Ismon, uh, would would people bat an eyelid? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I guess for me, I don't really. I mean, my work is is just my work. The writing is just the writing. So I don't really think in terms of um, nationality or anything like that. I'm just doing doing me personally. Um, I've got my own um, viewpoints on uh, Wales and Welsh politics and that kind of thing, but that would be out outside of my work. Um, you are a Welsh nationalist. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm an anti-British nationalist. I'm a pro-Wales -Well, pro um, person, citizen, <laughs> how we want to put it. Um, and yeah, but I guess that may kind of that may be apparent in the writing. I don't know, but it's not something I would ever consciously, um, consciously focus on. But I think, I guess, I see the the book as really super, like kind of universal. I think you could be. I think I saw. Um, I made maybe the mistake of, or or maybe it's actually I find it amusing of reading some good reads reviews, um, and there was some some really nice ones and there were some really extremely um, negative ones. But um, but one of the ones that was negative was saying that um, she was asking why it read like it was set in um, Long Island or um, and she sort of name checked various parts of America. So I guess um, anyone reading it will, even though it's clearly set where it's set, will will bring their own experience to it. So I think Geographically, I mean, it could it could be set anywhere. There's a lot of um, semi-rural, uh, but also close to water locations across the world. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. everybody seems to wear a navy blue cable knit sweater. Mm, well, yeah, I, I think um, <laughs> this is not cable knit, by the way. It's <laughs> oh well, yeah, that, that, that's disappointing. <laughs> yeah, I um. That was a big, I really, um, that people seem to really, really love the cable knit sweaters, um, the references. It seems to be something that everyone likes to mention and takes them from. 
Even the film that he goes to see with his girlfriend of the Norwegian film, to his dismay, everyone in, in the film is wearing a navy blue cable knit sweater. Yeah, well, this is and this is the thing with with Hill. Um, I think he can. He's a, a person who gets these preoccupations, which um, live rent free in his head, and they kind of. He's very prone to kind of obsessing and over analyzing um which i guess one of his strengths is his ability to analyze and it can kind of provide him with really unique viewpoints but the problem with that is if hill or if one just generally speaking allows um too much focus on too much detail i guess you kind of that that can make life difficult for yourself and and then that has made life difficult for Hill. An expression you use in the novel, which one of your critics picked up on, is Zen ni nihilism. Do you think that sums up Hill's approach to life? He's a, he's a very passive character in many ways. He's a very accurate observer, but an observer nevertheless. Uh, he doesn't take much of a proactive part, but given his situation in you know, returning to the island for his father's death, it's not entirely... Um, uh, he's not entitled to be blamed for that, I suppose. Well, no, I, get, I mean, it's kind of, it's interesting to think about that. Um, I would kind of tend to see, he, he's some, his kind of, his Zen nihilism is, he is maybe, well, certainly to begin with, is too deadened to everything. He's not responding enough. It's this kind of cold um analysis and that is his way his defense the wall he has um established around him um which makes it difficult i guess for people to come to him but it also makes it difficult for him to uh to, to come to people and to connect with people but on the other hand i guess it's the the journey he goes on in the novel um without giving too much away he he, he maybe comes to a point where it becomes more possible to still retain that kind of um, calmness and but at the same time allow emotion in but in such a way that it isn't deadening and it doesn't um, kind of put him on this flat line of where, where he can't respond emotionally. So he's a damaged person but who's uh, developing a system of self-repair in a way. Yeah, I think, and I think that's kind of, I guess that's one of the themes um, of the novel that I realised. I mean, I don't, I kind of never would plan a theme or anything like that. It, it just, it is, you realise what it is once you've done it. Um, and I guess the, the idea of it is possible, um, anyone can go through anything, and there is always hope that you can come out the other side of it and um, just accept What's, I think kind of acceptance um, is, is something that's really important. Um, you can accept what's happened and it doesn't lessen how difficult it was, but you are able to come out on the other side in a, in, in a positive um, life living way. Yeah. Well, the novel's full of paradoxes. What you've just said is, I think represents one of the paradoxes that when you're at rock bottom, you begin to see the light. Um, other paradoxes, or a paradox that's uh, omnipresent in the book, is that uh, you're, we're very much in the world of contemporary social media, in other words, communications technology, and it's communications in a world where nobody seems to communicate at least correctly. They're um, misunderstanding each other. There's a wonderful comic episode when he meets up with uh, an old school friend or acquaintance, and um, as happens when these things happen in real life, you know, he, it forces him to think about whether he's succeeded or not, whether the other guy has succeeded more than him or not. Does he have a nicer wife than he had? It's, and so on. And in what ways is his life? Uh, does he have a LinkedIn account? <laughs> and so on. I mean, um, communication, social communication, social media and the failure of communication, that paradox is part of the comic energy, the irony of the novel. Um, are you a uh, an addict to social media? Um, well, I'm, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say because I guess in in the great scheme of things, I mean, social media, I guess, as, as we know, I mean, it changes really rapidly, but it's only been around for um, 
what would it be uh, about? I mean, I think Facebook is about just over a decade old, I think. Um, I first had the internet in 1993. I think I was one of the first people in France to have it. Because oh. I'd heard about this email and about uh, chat rooms where you could talk to people in a yeah. in countries simultaneously. And I was just desperate to get hold of this technology. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, well, that's it. And I think kind of, I mean, even when people speak kind of nostalgically about these early versions, like kind of chat rooms, for example, or or even email when it first came out. It was very, I mean, it's far removed from what we've got now. But I think, I'm not sure, I guess, with all of these modes of communication, there is naturally more scope for um, these misunderstandings or these um, miscommunications. But prior to all of this, I mean, I I can't, I, I'm not sure really, but I think maybe communicate, there was just less communication and whether that's a good or a bad thing, I'm not sure. I don't think there's ever been a golden age of communication as such. Um, and whether, I mean, we're certainly not in one now. Um, I don't think there's been, been one beforehand. Um, so I guess, for, I mean, for Hale and for the other characters um, in the book, it's just kind of, managing that but I think certainly for me personally I would I, I would say it's kind of is it's good and, and it's also bad I mean it, it's both you can kind of spend too much time um, online and I certainly do enjoy disconnecting and just going for a hike or going for a run or working out or or you know or just or, or any anything along those lines so it's always a positive thing to do that. Well, look at us now. I'm in central France. You're in Cardiff, Wales. And our producer, Johnny Sabadin, uh, is in uh, Ravenna, I think, Johnny. Um, so there's a, there's a three-way link going on internationally. Global communication of that variety is something very new, I think. And it's not something that's to everyone's taste. I, I was watching last night, I was watching on YouTube some videos about uh, people who live off the grid in the United Kingdom. And a remarkable number of them were in Wales because the Welsh authorities have a, um, a generous and understanding attitude towards people who want to just build a mud hut in the middle of a forest and live off the land in a quiet and uh, ecologically sound way. So, And in your novel, there's a moment which I thoroughly enjoyed when there's a beach party and um, a kind of cry goes up to dispense with social media and people start, they, Trudy persuades people to throw their te mobile telephones into the sea. And uh, when, when it comes to Hill's turn, she quickly replaces the mobile phone with a stone. So when he throws a, a stone into the sea and people think he's thrown his mobile phone because obviously he can't be weaned off his uh, life support system. So, I mean, uh, is off the grid living something that's ever appealed to you or that you know um, about Wales? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I would probably say it's, off the grid living isn't so appealing to me personally. I think, well, I guess it depends how you live off the grid. Grid, I kind of, I like, um, I like home comforts. So like, a mud a mud hut wouldn't wouldn't be so appealing. Um, I like electricity and um, warmth and all that kind of stuff. But uh, certainly, I think I, th I I would kind of like this. I would I kind of like um, privacy. I mean, this is something I found quite in some ways relatively liberating about lockdown. Is um, when we've been in the lockdown where everything's been shut. I found it quite liberating to not have the option um, to go to a shop or go to a cafe um, and just maybe just go for a walk um, or or just sit quietly and, and read and get on with stuff. And I mean, there was a point where um, it kind of felt like when filming was not able to happen for, for TV and, and that kind of stuff, there was, and this seems kind of almost nostalgic to kind of look back on this period like eight months ago people were worried that television would run out there would there would be no, no kind of new stuff to watch and even that I think was quite nice because um it allowed us and certainly in our house we kind of looked back and we started watching a lot of 90s films um that we had maybe that had been lost in the sort of uh 
passage of time. And, and that was really interesting to us. So I think living in a more simple way, um, a more considered way and a quieter and calmer way is always something that would appeal to me. Or, but, I, but, but in a house that is warm and with electricity. <laughs> I second that emotion. Uh, I, I live out in a farmhouse in the middle of the French countryside and when I take my dog out for a walk, it's very peaceful. But there is always a background noise of distant cars or occasionally an aeroplane going over. What was eerie, during, especially during the first lockdown, was that all of that disappeared. And I think a lot of people had a kind of epiphanic moment when it felt like the end of the world, and yet it didn't feel too bad. It felt rather nice that uh, nature should um, uh, recoup some of the, at least the soundscape that had been stolen from it for so long. You talked about films and the fear that television and film would run out. It's, it's a good uh, segue to me asking you about a film, a documentary film that was made during a book tour that you made in Serbia. Um, was this promoting this novel, uh, Hello Friend, We Missed You, or the previous book? No, the, um, that was the, uh, all, the, all the places we lived, my short um, fiction collection. It was the um, Serbian translation, um, and then I was invited over to Serbia um, for for a week um, to do a book tour there. Um, yeah, and I was followed twenty four seven for the um, for the documentary, um, and and that was being in Serbia was brilliant. It was a really um, transformative experience. I found I really um, I really enjoyed it. It was it was magnificent. It was the first time I'd been to Serbia, and just to see how much they loved literature how kind of seriously and earnestly they embraced it um it, it was it was magnificent mm -hmm. uh, i think you've told me before that you're not actively involved in the making of that documentary which is a feature length documentary about your trip look it's going to be called ultra is that right or yeah ultra that's what i believe um yeah uh have you ever had any involvement in like your character hill in filmmaking or TV? Well, I think, um, no, uh, no, but I mean, we've had kind of, um, there's been interest in adaptation, um, film and TV adaptation for Hello Friend, We Missed You, um, which has been interesting. And then, but I guess from having friends who work in the industry, I'm aware it's a, it can be a, a long, long process for this kind of stuff, but it's nice to have people interested in, in talking to me about it. Um, I haven't heard from Jack Black yet, um, which I think would be just probably probably <laughs> meta on top of meta, which that, that would be great if, uh, if the book could find his way to his, to his house. You have actually taken his name in vain. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, think he, I think he would appreciate the humour. I think he would like it. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of his, um, earnestly. I, re I really, really... I think he's a, he's a fantastic um, right. Actor. And Jason Statham, I think, is another one, isn't it? British yeah. actor, Hollywood films. Yeah, yeah, Statham is another guy um, who I like. He's um, he's made some, I would say, classic Friday night kind of nine p.m. really really enjoyable action movies. I think he's one of the um, the crank. An icon of it, of his generation for those movies. I think he's, he's superb. Okay. I don't know his work, but I'll definitely. <laughs> uh, talking about influences, or if, if we are talking about influences, um, I've read a lot of what's been written about your book. You've been compared to Jonathan Franzen, Brett Easton Ellis, uh, somebody called you the Welsh David Foster Wallace. Paul Oster's name came up. Richard Yates' Revolutionary Road and Martin Amis. Do, do you, uh, what do you think of those uh, connections that are being made? Yeah, I mean, it's, anyone can compare me to anyone. That's absolutely, that's absolutely fine. That's okay. Um, I mean, I think out of those particular writers, I like, um, I really enjoy some of them. Um, and that, that's great. I kind of, I just, a lot of this kind of, noise and stuff um i just kind of let it just wash over um and and don't pay pay too much attention to it but yeah if people um want to make those comparisons and that helps 
put me in context for people who might be reading the review to say, okay, they, they might take something from the work. That's, that's cool. That's absolutely, uh, that's Are absolutely cool. Has influences on you? Are there um, writers, writers that you feel have really had an influence on how you write? Well, I think um, with, with someone like Brad Easton Ellis, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember reading him as a teenager and then again a little bit later um, in my early 20s. And I think what, and then having particularly recently on listening to his podcast and stuff, listening to him really talk about his, how he approaches writing. I think that's been an influence in the sense of I can, for me, style is like really, really important. How you um, put words into sentences and how you kind of focus on, on the style, not so much over the plot as such, but for me, style is equally as important as plot. And I mean, I wouldn't consider writing anything that didn't have a huge kind of pre-thought out focus on what, what the style was going to be. And then with someone like Jonathan Franzen, I think he's just extremely funny. I think he's, I find him really, really funny. And that, that brings me on to another question. Do you, do you consider yourself to be a comic writer? Yeah, yeah, I think, well, I I find myself funny. That's, uh, I think it's okay. It's okay for me to say I, that. I find you funny too. I really, I, I noticed in those good, what's it, what's it called? Good book reviews, good read reviews. Uh, some people, it, your humour simply escaped them totally and others latched onto it totally. In other words, you can't please all the people all the time. And some people are tuned in to what you're doing and other people aren't. Personally, I found um, your humour hilarious. I mean, at, at points there were some wonderful things, this disjunction between what Hill is thinking and what he's saying and um, his uh, self-doubt. All of this is the material of comedy. Well, yeah, thank you. Like, I, um, comedy is is really, um, really important to me personally, I think. And w what is really, um, what kind of speaks to me as a writer is, I think, I guess like the duality of something can be really sad or melancholy and it can also be funny at pretty much the exact same time. I think both both things can be true. Um, but yeah, like just kind of talking um, kind of comedic influences, probably the most influential would be um, the uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's short fiction. I think he, um, the, I don't know if you know the Pat Hobby stories. Um, to me, I mean, they were written in, uh, it would be the 1920s, and they're just the most radically hilarious, funny, timeless kind of things. And you can see the effect that that has had over, um, over kind of contemporary American, you'd say, uh, humour. And that's the kind of humour I like where I think it can be, you can litter stuff with references to pop culture or, or culture, and, and that on one level is the joke. But then also it can still be funny, even if you don't immediately have the reference to hand. Um, so like, for example, I think early Simpsons cartoons would have sort of these kind of literary allusions or allusions to um, pop culture from the 50s. And I wouldn't get that specific joke first off, but I would still understand the humour and it still would be funny on both levels. Um, and I think maybe uh, there have been people who have really enjoyed the humour of Hello Friend You Missed You. Um, and they've said, well, I didn't get the reference straight off, but it was still funny. And then I went back and checked the reference and I came back and I found it funny for a second time. So to hear stuff like that is really, um, is really satisfying. Um, to topical allusions of which you make many are always going to have a short shelf life, aren't they? Because the pop culture moves on and uh, main people that people are talking about all the time now will be forgotten in a few years time. So uh, you're dealing with um, sort of built in obsolescence in terms of your cultural illusions. But the same could be said of Shakespeare, that his uh, plays are replete with um, illusions that now escape us unless we have footnotes to explain them. Nevertheless, the works stand up in all of their tragicomic glory. Um, oh, one other writer, I mean, I noticed reading the writers, reading about the writers you enjoy, the name 
Richard Broutigan jumped out, who is also a writer I adore, you know, the trout fishing in America and uh, in Watermelon Sugar. These are extraordinary books that aren't enough read by people, I think. And he has a, a unique voice, uh, not exactly a comic voice, but he he's um, he's a poet, really. He's, an, he is, he's a poet and a stylist with an extremely uh, off-kilter vision of, of things. Interestingly, amongst nearly all of the novelists um, that you've been compared to were American, with the possible exception of Martin Amis. Uh, I, I might add Raymond Carver to that list. There's, uh, time and again, as I was reading your novel, um, little bits of Carver came back, the sort of deadpan prose, the laconic um, treatment of ordinary lives, uh, within which there are deep currents in a contemporary um, in a contemporary context. So uh, I had so many questions to ask you. <laughs> so, could I ask you, lastly, uh, about um, your life in Cardiff? You know, and uh, do you, do you work apart from writing or? Well, yeah, I um, I saw that at one time you were teaching in Cardiff prison. <laughs> yeah, um, I yeah I I've, I've taught in Cardiff prison. That's a um, a string to my bow. That's always an ex in, an interesting experience um, when I do that. Um, what did you teach? Um, well, I um I, I taught creative writing. I taught um, literacy as well. Um, one of the big issues in uh, in prisons is literacy levels will typically be very very low um so i think it's a really useful thing um if you can kind of impact on someone and boost their literacy levels up potentially that's going to have a knock-on effect when they're released um although sadly the situation we're in is with budgets being cut and austerity things like education in prisons have suffered really badly um which you know and that will have a knock-on effect for society for sure but um in terms of other work, I yeah, I'm just a freelance writer. That's just um, what I do. A lot of uh, just quite dry stuff. But what I what I really am able to do now, since having gone pretty much full time writing, is I'm able to write my own stuff every single day. Um, I work typically six days a week. Um, my I kind of keep my own hours. But yeah, I will I will always find time to write and, and work on. Um, work on whatever it is I'm working on writing wise. I think I read that you listen to loud music while you're writing. Is that right? Oh, no, uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> so, no um, I, uh, typically, what I kind of like is I like preferably, although this is, you probably, I probably get this less now. Um, I kind of like the uh, just loud background mm. noise, but I would never, I, I wouldn't listen to um, music when I'm writing, no, I, I wouldn't do that. I would just immediately be lost in the music and I would be out of the moment right. for the right. Something that Hanif Qureshi does. He listens to extremely loud rock music, but uh, I could never understand how that could be possible. Like, you talk about teaching creative writing in the prison. Which, um, you yourself, you studied English literature at uh, Manchester University yeah. and you followed a creative writing course at uh, Liverpool John Moore's University, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, so tell us a bit about that. Was that a formative influence or? Yeah, well, I think um, certainly. Well, OK, when I started the MA, um, I, can, I was really focused on script writing. Um, and that seemed like my, my kind of port of call. But we, as part of the MA, we had to select a different, um, a different genre, a different um type of writing to do for one of the modules. And I, I kind of wrote some short stories um, that went down really well. I had a lot of positive feedback and I was kind of taken from that moment. And it kind of coincided with, you're, you're talking about Carver. I I really got into Carver at that point, um, who is just, you know, just unreal. I mean, it seems obvious to say it, but he, he just truly, tr just truly incredible and powerful and just a, ma a magical, magical writer um and, and from that point on the kind of the script stuff um which I, I continued to do but became more and more 
marginal to the short fiction. Um, so yeah, it was and it, just brilliant, brilliant tutors um, at Liverpool John Moores on the MA. Really, really thankful to them. Um, and then, but on the uh, reading English at Manchester, that was that was kind of a different experience where. I guess honestly, I probably learned more the kind of literature that didn't interest me so much, <laughs> rather than anything that particularly did. Uh, the very traditional syllabus. Yeah, I mean, it, it may well have changed now, but it was kind of quite a, um, it was quite stuffy, um, and you know, things like Beowulf, that kind of thing, were com- mandatory, um, and it was just, it was just quite a slog at times. Mm-hmm. But it's okay. I probably benefited in ways that I don't realise. Um, so. And uh, last question: uh, What what are you working on now? If you're at, at liberty to speak about it. Oh yeah, no, no, of course. I'm um, well. I'm writing. I would say I've got a novel um, that I'm really getting deep into planning with, um, which is a different thing for me. Um, I didn't plan "Hello, Friend, We Missed You" so much. Um, but the novel I'm working on is a bigger, um, a, a bigger, a bigger task. Um, but again, it's set on Anismon. Um, but and then also I'm writing a collection of, I guess, auto fiction essays um, and and short fiction. Um, and, and I'm quite deep. I'm quite deep into that. Essays that you produce for the press or. No, no, I mean, things um, things that I'm writing now, um, and I've been working on this for a few months, and it and it's interesting. It's, I guess, having written a collection of short fiction, um, but then since that point, have become more influenced by autofiction and, um, and non-fiction as well, in, in terms of, I guess, like essay style writing. Um, I wanted to kind of, have the gap, the space in between the novels of a non-novel book. Um, but I mean, we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. It could be more, it could be leaning more on short fiction. But I, I, I guess I'm calling it short autofiction. So I'm kind of covering all of the bases, really. Um, so yeah, a short, a book of short autofiction. That'll be easier to say. Okay. Have you got, have you got a title for it yet? Yeah, um, it's called Thank You Anyone. And where, novel. Where does it come from? <laughs> well, I just, I just think, I guess, to give kind of more context to it, um, the the time span that the book covers would be approximately eighteen months, around about two thousand and eighteen onwards, um, and I would thank anyone who interacted with me during that period. Um, uh, talking of titles, um, am I allowed to explain where your title comes from? Sure, yeah, you can. Hello, friend, we missed you. Sounds an incredibly warm and cheerful title to uh, Richard's novel. In fact, in the context of the book, it's an SMS message that Hill receives from Domino's Pizza. In other words, uh, the machine intelligence has decided he hasn't bought a pizza for a while and it's time to to draw him back in. Uh, you know, a, a nice example of the speciousness of communication technology, which runs through this wonderful book, which I thoroughly recommend. Um, if there are any uh, European or world editors looking on for a good book to translate, this is uh, one I'd strongly recommend too. And likewise, you know, it's um, it has great filmic and TV potential, which I'm sure will be picked up on now that you've won the prestigious. Uh, not the Booker Prize. Richard, thanks very much for speaking to us and um, wish you all the best of luck with your next project. Project, And could you could we finish by asking you to read an extract from from your prize winning novel? Yeah, absolutely. Well, also, thank you for having me on and I've really enjoyed talking. It's been uh, it's been excellent. OK, um, yeah, I will read. Um, I'll read I'll read the opening. Um, the opening is a nice, you know, Nice way to get into. Is that, is that um, thing flying into the islands, right? Yeah. Well, okay. I can. Yeah, I can say a little bit. Yeah, Hill, um, the the protagonist of the novel, is returning to Anismon. Um, he's flying up there uh, on a small 
on a very small aeroplane, um, kind of a, a 24 person aeroplane. Um, and I guess he's in a moment of reflection or contemplation and also, which he's prone to being in. And also um, there's an impending sense of dread, I would say, um, as to what he'll be doing and, and where he's going. Um, okay. Music to crash to. Looking through the small oval window, deciphering only vague traces of geography and infrastructure through the clouds, Hill blinks slowly. Turning, he looks towards the pilots, two calm men silently staring ahead, occasionally pressing buttons on the dashboard. Hill touches his iPhone, opening then closing a free backgammon app, opening then closing a free solitaire app opening then closing a free drafts app. Hill touches his iPhone and puts ambient sounds, rain in a barrel on repeat. Thank you rain, thank you barrel, Hill thinks. Hill looks towards a South American couple sitting opposite him. The woman, her loose dark brown hair streaked with silver, is pointing a GoPro at the window recording. The man wearing a faded college sweater black jeans and scuffed multicolored Nikes, places his hands around the woman's neck, the woman playing along and flopping her tongue out, conveying, Dad, you got me, as she holds the GoPro in position, still recording, still documenting. Hill looks away, touches his iPhone and puts Sine Wave 2000 by Abelard on repeat. Hill looks back towards the couple, now pointing at the folksy illustrations of Celtic burial mounds an aspirational sea salt branding that covers one side of an expanded tourist pamphlet. Guide to Anglesey, Arweiniad i Anismon, Hill thinks. Hill listens as they repeat Bear Grylls Island Rib Ride back to each other over and over, grinning. Hill turns up the volume on his iPhone, looks straight ahead and closes his eyes. The aeroplane cabin rattles violently for a moment and then continuously for a sustained period. Hill opens his eyes and watches the South Americans laughing as they struggle to pour water from a bottle of Bracken Carrig into a silver hip flask without it spilling on the grubby metal floor. Happy maniacs, Hill thinks. Hill looks around the cabin. Two middle-aged women wearing charcoal business suits are talking and looking at a tablet. Two middle-aged men wearing white shirts tucked into chino shorts are talking and looking at a tablet. A woman in her twenties is gripping her armrest, her nails digging into the worn, faded material as she maintains a calm and stoic facial expression. Like Lucy, Hill thinks. Hill unmutes the volume on his iPhone and looks ahead. Hill becomes conscious of the aeroplane tilting, shuddering and then beginning to make its descent. Sine wave 2000 starts playing again. How many times, Hill thinks. Music to crash to, Hill thinks. Survival odds, Hill thinks. It's okay, Hill thinks. Hill looks ahead and shuts his eyes. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, that, that crash is always there waiting in the background, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Thanks a lot, Richard, and all the best. And uh, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much. Speak soon.